of the first fear is that because AI is faster and more efficient than humans in a lot of respects, and it's only getting better, that it's going to take all the jobs. If AI takes all the jobs and all the jobs go away, you lose money and therefore you can't take care of yourself. You can't feed yourself. You can't pay rent. You can't take care of the people that you care about. And that is just like humans have never been that fundamentally disempowered. If you go back to hunter-gatherer societies or agrarian societies, if you're hungry, go hunting. If you're lonely, like, go to the tribe. The worst case, you know, thinking, the catastrophic thinking around AI is that there's going to be so much competition that you won't have any options to feed yourself. You won't have any options to, you know, put a roof over your head or take care of the people that you care about. Or even maybe all the people are going to be so addicted to their VR girlfriends that they're not going to want to spend time with another human because humans are lame, right? Who knows? So that instead of training a model to just optimize for what's going to get the best response, let's optimize it for these universal principles, these post-conventional principles that will actually focus on what is actually good for humanity. Today, I am talking to my favorite YouTuber, and he is the best at painting a picture of artificial intelligence from all angles. His best video is called Post-Singularity Predictions, How Our Lives, Corporations, and Nations Adapt to AI. His name is David Shapiro. David has 14 years of experience in deep learning and cognitive neuroscience. He started his professional journey as an infrastructure engineer, and he specializes in automation. And in my opinion, he is the leading commentator on AI and provides a unique blend of speculative and practical tutorials and interesting thought experiments. In this episode, we discuss basic definitions of AI and language models. We discussed the Moloch problem. We talked about incentives. We talked about doomerism, optimism, and how it could create a utopia or a dystopia. We talked about the growing concern of unequal distribution of wealth as a result of AI. We talked about David's movement that he has started called Gato and how if enough people get on board, we could increase the odds of a positive future with AI. We talked about how AI could unlock the option to live till you're 300 or 400 years old. We talked about how AI could unlock new energy sources. And finally, we also discussed how all of us can make a difference no matter where we are in life. But with that said, let's just hop into the conversation. Well, David, thank you for joining me on this podcast. How are you and what have you been up to recently? Thanks for having me. Um, I'm doing pretty good, you know, uh, recovering from burnout because it happens in the age of AI. Lately, I've been, you know, just cranking out on my YouTube videos. I've been uh, building chatbots with long-term memory, you know, kind of doing my own independent research. And um, I've also got a research community that I'm a leader of called uh, the Gato Framework, the Gato Community. Uh, so yeah, been been staying pretty busy. I love it, and that I immediately want to ask you about the chatbot with long-term memory and how you're doing it. But let's first start off with the basics. And just for my followers, can you give us a, a definition of AI and LLM just to get people up to speed? So we kind of know what we're, we're talking about here. Yeah, good question. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, artificial intelligence is the domain of using machines in order to solve problems, right? Whether it's a mathematical problem or what we have today is language problems. So that's what language models do. They're a type of deep neural network that is trained pretty much just like any uh, auto, uh, not autocorrect, auto predict. Um, so like on your phone or Google or whatever, you might notice that it'll kind of predict the next couple words. Um, that's what these models are basically trained to do, but they're trained on like basically the entire internet. Um, so they can predict pretty much anything on any topic. And that ability gives them a, a lot of implied or implicit knowledge about how to solve all kinds of problems including planning, reasoning, because, you know, it's read everything on Reddit. It's read every article, every book that's on the Internet. So it has a lot of knowledge baked in. Yeah. And speaking of Reddit and uh, companies like Quora, there's an objective to kind of protect data on these websites. And I think Elon Musk even said that he's going to be suing OpenAI for scraping the data off of Twitter. Can you speak to that a little bit and the importance <laughs> of having having data and using your data effectively as from a perspective of a business? Yeah. So one of the um, one of the mantras that I heard a few years ago, and it kind of really stuck with me is uh, data is the new oil. And this mantra came out before, you know, chat GPT and all that stuff. So this was this was in the machine learning world, in the, the business world. You know, there's a there's a policy in Europe called GDPR, uh, which basically it, it was at the general something general principles of data retention or something like that. Point being is that uh, with the rise of social media and other things and the way that it was used 
uh, very harmfully in some cases, uh, Europe decided to say, hey, you know, you're going to have the right to be forgotten. You're going to have the right to control where your data lives, who has access to it, and that sort of thing. Uh, America does not yet have a uh, policy as comprehensive as GDPR. But basically the idea was uh, it, there's a, a now infamous um, hearing where Mark Zuckerberg was called before Congress here in America. And a lot of congressmen couldn't understand how Facebook was free. They're like, well, what, like, what do you sell? And he's like, we sell ads. And they're like, well, how do you sell ads? And it's like, well, because we have data on our users that we can then use for marketing purposes. And of course, a lot of senators and congressmen, they just couldn't wrap their heads around that. And so data is incredibly valuable because, and not just for marketing purposes, you can use it for all kinds of things. Um, so data is is incredibly valuable. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad. Um, and so in this case, when particularly when ChatGPT came out and it started replacing Google, right? A lot of people go to ChatGPT or similar chatbots before Google search now. It's disrupting the information landscape, which is, uh, one, there's the possibility of economic upset, right? Like, you know, Google has lost some stock price because of that. Uh, but then there's the other possibility of, you know, if you're taking something of value from someone, you should get something in return. And so one of the first things that Elon Musk did was he turned off the Twitter API. Um, and now it sounds like he's escalating and he's going to, you know, he and maybe others are going to try and sue because it's like, hey, technically you you might have had access to that. But this is actually really, this is our lifeblood, right? The data on Reddit is the lifeblood of Reddit. The data on Twitter is the lifeblood of Twitter. And so if you take that and don't give anything in return, I mean, just, you know, we learned this in, in preschool. That's not fair, <laughs> right? So it's no surprise. Yeah, and it, couldn't you argue that it's it's very similar from an artist's perspective with companies like Midjourney and Stability AI? It's, it's a very similar, if not almost the exact same thing in terms yeah, of, e of art. Exactly, it's, it's a matter of if you've got the information, if you've got the data, if you've got uh, whatever it is that you're generating or, or that you're consuming of value and whatever it is that you're generating of value. And so one way that you can look at this is through the lens of copyright. So for instance, if you know, you're know you a comic book artist or you make a movie or you're a singer or whatever, uh, nobody can take that take your content and make money off of it unless you give them permission to or you license it to them or something like that because we value uh you know by and large we value things like um in our intellectual property rights and this all falls under uh the broader umbrella of property rights do are you know are you allowed to own something physical intellectual uh so on and so forth and if you are allowed to own that then how do you enforce it right and how do you ensure that you have a fair you know, way a fair marketplace of getting what you need, but also it it uh, the under the underpinning question is what is fair? What is fair use in this case? And that is a very much an open question. Right. Switching gears a little bit. So the the way that I came across your YouTube channel was this big thumbnail. I remember it, and it said AGI is 18 months away. And I watched that video. That was kind of my portal into your framework. Can you describe? that prediction and why you believe it. Yeah, so uh, just I guess a quick recap of that video was uh, I, I had casually mentioned in a previous video, I was like, oh yeah, like AGI is like 18 months away and someone's like, yeah, whatever, that's BS. Um, and I was like, no, actually like, I'm paying attention to all the papers, all the science, all the work being done. Like this is not just a, a, a I mean, I guess it is, is kind of a, it's a slightly educated guess. We'll put it that way. Um, but by, by paying attention to the trends, uh, you know, and, and I don't just mean like what people are saying on Twitter. I mean, the, the actual data, right? Uh, you look at the growth of investment in AI, for instance, um, Cohere just got what? $270 million to compete with open AI. This was like yesterday or the day before that that was announced. So you, you follow the money, right? The money is being thrown at it. So that that's, you know, that it's going to happen that way. Parameter count data, all that kind of stuff is going up. And then the number of papers, the number of scientific publications talking about AI is also going up exponentially, which we have really never seen that. We've seen plenty of things go up exponentially, you know, uh, the use of cars to replace horses, the amount of electricity being consumed, human population. We've seen lots of things go up exponentially. I don't know that we've ever seen uh, scientific publications go up exponentially, or, or at least not this fast on a particular topic. And so if you look at this rate of investment, this this nexus of just insanity, money, science, 
data, all of it coming together, my inevitable conclusion is that, you know, it's going to go somewhere, right? Either we're going to hit a wall and we're going to figure out AGI is impossible, which I don't believe. And I think that a lot of people don't believe that anymore. There are certainly still some people out there that say AGI is not going to happen or it's a long ways away. But when you look at this exponential ramp up, um, you know, there's there's this concept called takeoff, whether it's soft takeoff or hard takeoff, which is the idea that you get these compounding returns, the snowball effect where, you know, AI version, you know, GPT-3 helps you write GPT-4 and GPT-4 helps you write GPT-5, you know, so on and so forth. And so you get these compounding returns that lead to this exponential growth and this takeoff. And that, I mean, honestly, it kind of feels like that's what we're in because, you know, if you're paying attention, like there are, there are other YouTuber, other YouTubers and creators out there that there is a, like, important paper every day, it seems like, or an important piece of code or, you know, model released every day now. It's not, you know, a couple of years ago, it was once a month, right? Or once every couple of months. And then earlier this year, it was like once or twice a week. And now it's every day, daily. Like we were joking that like, if you have, if you go for 12 hours without uh, seeing a major AI breakthrough, then that's like the new AI winter. <laughs> it's, it's happening so fast. Absolutely. I have noticed that it is, it is just as a content creator, it's great, right? Cause you know, mm. as a content creator, you're looking for things to talk about and it just comes, it comes to you as someone who has a large audience on TikTok. it, it it's just incredibly easy to make engaging content because all of these breakthroughs feel like a brand new paradigm. And I don't know if people relate to this in my generation, like I'm 26 and mm -hmm. I feel like it has been relatively stagnant prior to like 2018, like throughout my whole life technology. Yeah, we got iPhones, um, which got like a, a camera upgrade. The screen got sleeker or whatever every year. But other than computers and iPhones, I feel like I, I haven't really experienced a major technological breakthrough. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I mean, I, th this reminds me of a conversation I had. Uh, someone, an, an older gentleman messaged me on LinkedIn and he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to rely on you younger people to help help us older folks figure out what it's like to live through a technological breakthrough. And then I was like, you know, I'm wondering if that's backwards because I remember talking to my my wife's grandmother who like, you know, she was there when color TVs came out and then radios and then digital radio and internet. And so like older, the, the point is, is that older people um, have seen many, many breakthroughs and they kind of get used to it, right? But this is, uh, this is the same generation that was there and watched you know, Apollo 11 launch and was listening live when people landed on the moon. And so for the last, you know, 50 or so years, particularly in America, there's this kind of belief that like anything is possible. So people that live through some of those breakthroughs, they're not surprised by anything because they've seen it, right? They're like, you know, the idea of what was impossible before, you know, humans landed on the moon was one you know, school of thought. And then after that, it's like, oh, well, we can do anything. But, you, you know, people like you and I, we haven't lived through that yet. You know, when we were growing up, it was, uh, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, but like it was, you know, getting your first personal computer, getting your first phone, getting your first laptop. Those are a big thing. And now it's just like expected. It's just default. And then artificial intelligence was always this thing that was on the horizon, right? Like maybe one day, you know, 2050, 2060, you know, if you, you're, you're going to be lucky to see it in your lifetime. And so for us for in this generation, you know, whether it's a uh, Gen Z or Gen Y or whatever, this is kind of the first thing that we're living through that is really one. We know that it's disruptive as we're seeing it happen. Um, but we're also the level of disruption we can only guess at. And so like everyone kind of knows the magnitude or, or, or rather they know that the magnitude is bigger than we can comprehend. <laughs> right. So that's kind of that's kind of what it feels like to me. Can you describe the the Moloch dynamic and kind of mm. why all of the it seems like we're racing towards a cliff and no one can individually stop? Yeah. So in this case, um, you know, Moloch is a mythical figure, uh, which might make it seem a little uh, hyperbolic to some people, a little, little bit silly. Um, but there's, in much more mundane terms, we're locked in what's called a race condition. The race condition, um, or race to the bottom, or however you want to call it, the, the word race is correct because it's uh, essentially on, at least on a corporate level, the first company to crack, you know, the next type of AI, they have an advantage. They have the, what's called a first mover advantage. Um, so this is why Elon Musk with Tesla is so big, why Elon Musk with, with SpaceX is so big is because they had the first mover advantage on mass production of electric vehicles, the first mover uh, advantage on producing self-landing rockets. There are other electric car companies out there now. There are, uh, you know, the, the, the big ones, you know, 
Toyota and Honda and Chev- Chevrolet, they're all building electric cars now, but the Tesla was there 10 years ago, right? Uh, same thing with SpaceX. There's a lot of other uh, self-landing rocket systems out there, some of them being developed by other nations, right? I think India and China are working on self-landing rockets, but again, they're behind the curve. And so there's this huge economic advantage to being the first one across the finish line. So that's part of the race condition. On a global scale, there is also a race condition. The same, the same exact thing applies to nations, to GDP, right? So everyone's heard like, you know, stock market's going up, GDP's going up, whatever. So the, the first nation to really crack AI is going to have a big, uh, huge geopolitical advantage. And this also extends to the military, right? Because every, every new technology is basically dual purpose, which means that it can be used for good or it can be used for destruction. And so you have all these forces, these national forces, these corporate forces, forces, these military forces, all of them will benefit from AI. And the ones who get there first are going to do best. And so then you're incentivized to kind of throw caution to the wind and get to the finish line as fast as possible. Um, so that's really kind of at the biggest level. That's what Moloch means. That's the that's the game theory of, OK, we're locked in a race condition. It could go horribly wrong, right? Because if you're going, you know, 800 miles an hour towards the finish line, you might sail off of a cliff because um, you lose control at that speed. So that's kind of the context that we're in right now. My favorite example of this that I thought of is just kind of social media about how they all optimize for outrage, in-group, out-group dynamics. And no one at these companies, if you're a company, if you're at Google on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, no individual at these companies wants to make their users less happy or more anxious. But those are the things that gets views and eyeballs. And so they're all racing and the, the bad outcome is the thing that ends up is what they're optimizing for. And it's just hard because if you don't do it, then Snapchat's going to do it and they're going to take all of the market share. And so I, I think that was just a useful thing for me to like fully grasp that yep. problem. Yeah. And it, it, it comes down to optimization. What are you trying to optimize for? Um, the social media algorithms, which, you know, there's been a few documentaries and of course, plenty of uh, criticism um, about it. The, 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 uh, the engagement algorithm, it's measuring just one thing which is time on site or time in app. And then it's finding the variables that it can tweak, you know, what posts to show you when in what order, uh, the, the kinds of content, the kind of people to show you. Um, and by tweaking that, those little variables, it can kind of dial in and figure out, even on an individual level, what is going to keep you most engaged. Um, and it depends on, you know, the emotion that it's engaging, whether it's uh, anger or disgust. Those are two of the most powerful ones. Um, but it can also be like, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard the, the term thirst traps or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like if you, if you show someone, particularly men, a little bit of sexy content, they cl- they're like, oh, it even measures how long you, you hover over something before screaming scrolling past. And so it's like, oh, well, you you looked at that picture for a half of a second rather than just, you know, rapidly scrolling. So then it's like, aha, that got your attention. So let's do more of that. And that's actually why I had to, I I deleted my Instagram many years ago. Cause like one of the things that I like is like cosplay, right? But like, you 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 want you click on one cosplayer and then it shows you like all the worst thirst traps in the world and so i'm like all right let me just delete this because it's dialed in on like the addiction algorithm um and so that that is one kind of optimization problem but then when you're trying to optimize say for income then you have an entirely different set of incentives so uh you know the engagement algorithm translates to ad revenue which is why you know the engagement algorithm exists. Uh, now, that being said, when you have other strategic decisions, like how much money are you gonna invest in artificial intelligence? How much are you going to automate away jobs? Those are all still driven by, again, a single metrics, which is the bottom line, which is how much money you're making. And so if you ever hear the term like, that's a perverse incentive, basically it's not like, perverse incentive like thirst trap, it could be, but perverse incentive is an economic term, which basically means you are incentivized to do something that is self-destructive uh, in the long run. And so uh, a, a broad example of that is we still use fossil fuels, even though we know it's hurting us, right? The fumes from exhaust, like you get, you end up with smog, uh, you end up with climate change. There's, there's all kinds of reasons that fossil fuels are bad for us, but 
it is the most efficient fuel that we have, and so we are incentivized to keep using it until we have a sustainable alternative, and we don't yet have a scalable, sustainable alternative. And so we're kind of locked in this, not only a race condition, but this set of incentives that, that hurt us. And we know that it's hurting us and we can't get off, right? You're, you're, you're on the roller coaster and you can't get off this ride until you find a way to stop it and get on a different ride. This makes me think, and this was my initial gut reaction this week when I saw the Apple presentation with the headsets and I, the primary use of these devices, I'm worried, is, is social media times 10, only fans times 10, because for whatever reason, people like to make comparisons to the past and be like, okay, this, this Apple headset is like the iPhone. And then people are like, oh, but the iPhone's just like the previous generation's magazine. No, it's not. Like you're completely ignoring intensity. Gary V has, uh, I don't know if you know who this character is, but he makes the claim that the iPhone is exact, like the reason you're anxious from iPhones is the same as the previous generation with magazines. And I just think it's a, it's a terrible comparison because the, if you introduce something like an Apple headset, when it's tracking your eyes and seeing your movements, it's gonna like more intricately understand what would get you hooked or what type of thirst traps would work. And then you pair that with AI and the fact that I feel like there's like this intersection, this dangerous intersection of OnlyFans, VR, and AI. And so like you have these AI generated models or whatever, like you like think of like the thirst trap times a million. And right. Are you worried about this technology being under the same the same dynamics that you just described? <clears throat> That's a really good question, and I have to answer it in several parts. Um, so the first part is I'm not worried about it for me personally because um, I have like uh, I, I've been through this. You know, like I have digital wellness set up on my phone so that like literally if I'm using an app, it tries to shut it off every five minutes. So it's a r little reminder, like, hey, like, are you getting lost in the algorithm? <laughs> um, so there are tools out there. Now that being said. Um, not everyone's going to use these tools or these tools are not necessarily the best way because it's also easy enough to disable it. Right. Um, and so from a, from a human perspective, I guess, yes, I am. I am a little bit concerned about some of these things more broadly because, uh, you know, again, the, the value, like I would get rid of my smartphone if I could. Right. But I need it because I have MFA enabled, right? If I need to get into my accounts, I need a phone. And then if I get lost, I need Google Maps. I, you know, and if I want music, I need Spotify. Like there's all these things that I need, or at least I feel like I need. Um, there's plenty of people that do digital minimalism and kind of let go of these things. Um, but like, uh, for instance, a few months ago, I dropped my phone on the way into the movie theater and it broke. Like it was still, it was still on, but the screen was dead. And so then I had to wait for a week and like, that was the best week ever. Like no one could call me <laughs> and there was, there was no chance of any addictive behaviors. And I was like physically present in the real world. And so like, yeah, I will agree with some people that say like, oh, you know, technology, it, it goes through cycles. And, you know, because to, to your point, people said the same thing about novels, right? When when novels became the big thing in the 1800s because printing got more efficient, people thought that it was going to be the end of society because there was like the penny dreadfuls and erotic novels and stuff. And they said, oh, this is, you know, because the aristocracy said books are for education and stuff and not for this, you know, not, not for this drivel and whatever. But that being said, there are technological, there are fundamental differences in how this information is delivered. And so to your point, when you have um, like a VR mask or something that is much more tightly integrated to what's called your sensorium. So sensorium is the total amount of information you're taking in from the outside world. And so if you have like 7.1 um, uh, headphones, like what I've got on, right, gaming headphones, if you've got a full field of view mask, then that actually does trick your brain. Like neurologically speaking, your brain is like, okay, well, I'm getting enough information that I'm in this other environment, so I think that I'm there. And so, for instance, if you're playing a horror game or an action game, you have a much stronger physiological response, like at a at a foundational level, than even if you're playing the same exact game just on a conventional console with a regular controller. And so, like, I've seen little kids, you put them in a space sim and they, like, freeze up, right? Because they think that they're floating in space and they don't, you know, their brain is like, okay, I'm now in a dangerous situation where, you know, they can watch YouTube videos about space and not freeze up in the same way. 
And so you have this much more rich experience, which does uh, have a lot of possible uh, benefits, right? You can train doctors to do surgery. You can train soldiers. You can train, you can do all kinds of education and training design. Um, architects and engineers can use VR for, you know, much, much faster iteration. But again, as I mentioned earlier, all technologies are dual use today. And so if you apply, you know, the, the excitement algorithm or the arousal algorithm or whatever algorithm you want to maximize user enjoyment, that device is going to become addictive just the same way that phones can become addictive. Um, and so, uh, and, and, but it, it, here's the other thing is like, maybe that's what people want, right? Like in order to have the most experience from this device. But then again, you, you're bouncing up against like the fundamental truth of just being a human. You know, we evolved under certain circumstances and, and so on. And, you know, managing addiction today, like alcoholism or gambling addiction or whatever is one thing. But when it's a device that you have a, like at all times, it's a lot harder to get away from, especially when those devices are very useful and if everyone is doing it. Um, so I'm, that's not really an answer, just kind of unpacking all the nuance. Like it is a very complicated problem. In your videos, you describe different perspectives in AI and there's, you know, famous people who have become memes on social media who have these different perspectives. And I'm wondering, before we get into the optimist case of AGI, can you break down the, the doomer perspective and kind of steel man that argument and, and, and show why there is some weight to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's, it, there's several scales, right? It depends on the time horizon that you're talking about. In the shortest time horizon, yes, things like VR and AI being used to manipulate your beliefs or whatever, that is a thing that is like actively happening, right? So that's a totally legit fear. Um, and that can lead you towards more dystopian outcomes like, oh, you know, the, the the company knows everything about you and knows exactly what buttons to press to get more money out of you, to make you more depressed, to make you more anxious so that you'll buy more products, so on and so forth. That is like near term. And most um, AI based legislation and laws that people are working on um, talk about that. So that that has more to do with AI ethics, like the ethics of how do you regulate these technologies so that they are not as or to, to control or mitigate harm. So that's like that alone, you know, is worth paying a lot of attention to. But in the longer term, the the, the worst case scenario is that uh, either there, there's kind of two primary ways, either someone builds an AI that uh, ultimately makes the decision to like wipe out humanity or even worse, like punish us, right? Rocco's Basilisk is a thought experiment where like the AI might end up being so evil that if you didn't help create it, it'll like torture you for the rest of existence. Most people don't believe in that idea, but it was just kind of like someone was brainstorming like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? Not that, not just that it kills you, but it tortures you forever. Um, so that's like absolute worst case scenario, but you know, dialing it back uh, a little bit, there is the possibility that either someone creates something that is ultimately destructive uh, or that deliberately creates something that de that's destructive or because we lose control or because of unforeseen circumstances, it becomes destructive for any number of reasons. And the idea is that once a machine is, you know, there's there's a few criteria and it, different schools of thought, but once a machine is efficient enough, fast enough, self-improving um, or autonomous enough or any combination of these, then you could end up with this like spiral uh, of where you just completely lose control of it and it becomes incomprehensible. Like you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So the, the idea is that if that happens, if this array of things is possible, then it almost seems like it's inevitable, right? And when you look at the exponential ramp up of AI powers, you know, whether you know, from one model to the next or the underpinning hardware that runs it, and you know, already people are trying to build semi-autonomous or fully autonomous versions of these things. Like it seems like, okay, this is inevitably coming. So how do we stop that? And um, you know, that's that's like the full-on doomer is like it, it the the how do I say this? What doomers tend to believe, obviously I can't put everyone in like one big basket, but what they tend to believe is that they look at this array of facts and they say, you know, humans are like irredeemably short-sighted. There's no way we can stop this. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of how soon. And therefore, like, we're probably all going to die. Right. And to be completely fair, like, like as as optimistic as I am, I say, like, yes, that is a very real possibility, which is why I do the work that I do. Um, now, that being said, the key difference is that I believe that these problems are solvable. I think that's that's good to have a, a balance, right? You don't want to be too pessimistic because then you're like, screw it, we're all gonna die. Or if you're too optimistic, then you're like, okay, why do anything? We're gonna be fine, 
right? Yep. You want to have that, um, that balanced perspective. And I, I think that's what's really, really cool about Gato, which we're going to get to in a second. One of the interesting things that I think people on TikTok, I've noticed in the comments, I get thousands of comments a day, like, what are we going to do? And I, I think a lot of it comes down to, again, they're doomers in a different way than someone like Eliezer is. And, and they're, they're, they're like, even if it's the best case scenario, or even if we can align the AIs and we can create prosperity, they think that it's going to be completely unequally uh, distributed, or there's going to be, there's this idea that we're going to have overlords or different species, um, which are honest, they're, they're real concerns. That's not like mm -hmm. they're, they're memes. Like these are actually real concerns. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, as you've said in one of your videos, people are worried about not being able to take care of the things that matter to them or take care of their basic needs. And I, I'm curious, can you speak on that and just talk about kind of why people might feel that way? Yeah, I mean, so there's um, any number of scientific theories or cultural you know, references about this. But at the end of the day, um, people want to know that they feel safe, right? They want to know that they're going to be OK, that they're going to be taken care of in some form or another. And in some cultures, particularly here in America, we have this um, we, we put a high value on self-reliance, right? And that is one, you know, cultural aspect. Uh, but to like, I guess, take a, a bigger step back, it's kind of a fundamentally true thing for all humans, right? There's a bunch of basic needs that we all need. We need food, we need shelter, we need water, we need clothes, um, we need connection to other people. So these are these are things that are kind of foundationally true, regardless of where you are, how old you are, or where you come from. Now the question is, how do you get those needs met, right? And in, and that's what I was referring to in America, where it's like self-reliance is one of the things that we value. Uh, but regardless of how you get your needs met, whether you meet them yourself or through family or through, um, you know, through the company. Right. Some people say, like, you know, the company is a family uh, or from the government or whatever. The idea is that AI. So the first fear is that because AI is faster and more efficient than humans in a lot of respects, and it's only getting better, that it's gonna take all the jobs. So if AI takes all the jobs and all the jobs go away, you lose money and therefore you can't take care of yourself. You can't feed yourself, you can't pay rent, you can't take care of the people that you care about. And that is just like, humans have never been that fundamentally disempowered, right? Because if you go back to you know uh, hunter-gatherer societies or agrarian societies, if you're hungry, go hunting. Right. If you're if you're lonely, like go to the tribe. But if the, the, the worst case, you know, thinking the catastrophic thinking around AI is that there's going to be so much competition that you won't have any options to feed yourself. You won't have any options to, you know, put a roof over your head or take care of the people that you care about. Or even maybe all the people are going to be so addicted to their VR girlfriends that they're not going to want to spend time with another human because humans are lame, right? Who knows? There's all these possible outcomes that like, and it's, it, these are like, this is not something that is just um, conjured up and out of thin air. These are stuff that there is evidence for, right? Screen addiction is a real thing. And then as you pointed out earlier, it's that with VR, it could get worse. And then, of course, there's the economic incentives where the companies just want to make money whatever way that they can. And if they have an intelligent uh, entity that it can, can maximize that value, um, that's not maximizing for happiness or health or wellness or whatever else. Um, so those are kind of some of the, the, the near term um, uh, concerns. Daniel Schmachtenberger was was someone that you've talked about in reference to the Moloch problem. And he always talked about how. Basically, the, when, when companies go after these massive upsides, there's usually negative externalities or, and, and companies often don't have to pay for those, right? It, the, the addiction, the anxiety, and if you follow like Jonathan Haidt's work, a lot of people, um, you know, there's suicides. Social media mm -hmm. is killing young people. Like the suicide rates are, are up and, and companies don't have to pay for these negative externalities. So it's not necessarily fair for any major company who is pursuing AI, not worried about the risks, not taking the necessary precautions, and then in theory, getting a lion's share of the, the rewards that comes from getting the first AGI or, or powerful AI system. Yeah, no, so market externalities are, are a big uh, component, which is a, a brief definition for anyone who's not familiar with market externality. As you said, it's there's something that you get that you didn't have to pay for, or the, the payment is offset to the future um, or to other people. 
So in the case of uh, mentioned fossil fuels earlier, gasoline, petroleum, coal, there is no upfront cost other than extraction because it's just a resource that's there. It's just buried. So you poke a hole in the ground, you, you suck out the oil, you use it. So there's no cost to replace it, right? So a, a parallel to that is you have to grow food, right? You don't just, uh, you, corn doesn't grow on its own. Uh, wheat doesn't grow on its own. Pigs, cows, food doesn't grow on its own. You have to allow nature to regenerate that resource. It's a renewable resource. Fossil fuels are not. And so part of the market externality is there's no price of replacing that fuel. Uh, and so that that's like the most common uh, or biggest example over the last few decades is uh, the the cost of petroleum, just the extraction part. Then, of course, there's the downstream effects, the the health benefits or sorry, the health detriments rather of things like smog. But then also um, uh, the biggest cost of fossil fuel of using fossil fuels is that we haven't even fully realized it yet, and that is climate change. If Within 20 to 30 years, we have half a billion climate refugees because of wildfires, flooding, drought, uh, and that sort of thing. Like that is a price that we can only predict, right? We can only anticipate it, and someone's going to have to pay that bill eventually. And so then, to to bring that into more uh, present terms with artificial intelligence, exactly to your point, uh, whatever the long term outcomes are, whether it's uh, or, or I guess uh, externalities, whether they're long term externalities or just things that are happening today, like depression, anxiety, suicide, uh, addiction, that sort of stuff. These are things that, that the people who pay for it, the people who bear the cost, are either um, you know, ordinary people like you and me or people in the future, right? Either way, regardless of what, how it plays out, the person who's not paying for it is the tech CEO or the tech company or the shareholders. Um, and so then the question becomes, okay, well, how do you price that in? How do you punish the person for the harm that they do. So one thing that we've tried, and of course the, the success rate is debatable, is carbon taxes, right? So if, if a company is known to pollute and doesn't meet their, their, their you know, quotas or whatever for uh, carbon sequestration or, or reduction of uh, emissions, then you just tax them for their, the pollution that they do. Um, the, again, like you can debate as to whether or not this is effective or fair or whatever. Uh, but that's like one of the only models that we've got for like forcing someone, a company to take responsibility for the damage that they're doing. Now, there's another uh, philosophy out there that, that is much more popular in Europe, and it's super, super unpopular here um, in America. And it's also unpopular in Europe, but it's not as unpopular. And this is called ESG. So that is environmental, social and governance which has to do with uh, this new school of thought called stakeholder capitalism. So the idea of stakeholder capitalism is that uh, companies should take into account everyone, whether or not it is a, a supplier or, cus or consumer of their goods or services. So this is like more abstract macroeconomic theory, but the idea is that if you incentivize the behavior at a corporate level, say, hey, rather than just you know goods and services just wheeling and dealing, you need to take into account those market externalities. And so what this is doing is it's shaping the investment structure of finance in Europe, and it's leaking over to America as well, according to some of the people that I talk to. But the idea is that if a company does not take into account the full impact of, of their goods and services, then they don't get as much investment. Of course, this is not happening with AI. Like you do anything with AI, you get all the investment that you want because ESG has not yet expanded to that. And of course, there's no taxes. There's no suicide tax, right? If you have a social media app that drives up uh, uh, anxiety and depression. And these are just ideas. These are not necessarily comprehensive solutions to the problem because, again, this is the intersection with some of our failings as humans, right? Our, the way that our brains evolved, the way that our bodies evolved. Like, technology is brand new, right? We have not yet evolved to fully interact with technology even though we can learn how to use it. So that's like, you know, when I talked to earlier about the VR mask, your brain can't tell the difference, to a certain extent, if you're in if you're in a, a VR uh, simulation with AI, don't you think it'll be easier to measure these different things and maybe um, easier to gather data? Um, and maybe we can actually go beyond just carbon tax and and look at other um, indicators. Will AI make gathering data easier? Well, so this this gets into the 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 reason that all of this is super tricky. Like whether you're talking about Moloch or just market externalities or perverse incentives, is that you can know that you need a different solution, but still not be able to make that choice, 
Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is that the value of AI is so high, the potential, the, the current value is so high. Like, for instance, there are plenty of people that already rely on ChatGPT to do lots and lots of stuff. Um, you know, I'm always using it to brainstorm um, videos, to help write my code, to, you know, figure out stuff like there's so much research that I've been able to do because of chat GPT. So therefore, I'm going to keep using it. Now, that being said, that data could be used to harm me intentionally or otherwise. I'm not saying that open AI is evil. I don't I mean, as far as companies go, open AI does a pretty good job of trying to reduce harms. Now, that being said, they're kind of like operating in a little bubble, right? but they don't control the whole AI landscape. They don't control everything. And so there's there's unforeseen uh, interactions. Um, there's also just completely unanticipated forms of harm. So there, I mean, there's it's, it's a very, very complicated uh, kind of problem. Now, one ray of hope that I have, and this is this is one of the things that um, that is kind of the centerpiece to some of my research, is that as we create AI agents that have more autonomy, more agency and more of their own self-direction, we can use that to uh, basically shape how you interact with that technology. So super, super simple example. And, you know, like I mentioned, I have like digital wellness, you know, settings on my phone. Imagine if my phone was smart enough to say like, hey, Dave, it looks like you're uh, you're kind of in a death spiral, <laughs> you know, like you're doom scrolling, maybe like set the phone down and go do something else that's gonna be more healthy and more productive and more engaging. We have the capacity to do that right now. And there are plenty of people who would choose to enable that feature on their phone. And who knows, maybe it should be enabled by default, right? Where it says like, hey, my, my purpose as a phone is not to be a passive tool that just allows you to have a portal to every addictive app out there. My purpose as your phone is to be a, an information partner to help you know, optimize your life. And I don't mean optimize it from the corporate perspective, I mean optimize it for you. And so what I'm hoping, and this is this is a big part of my advocacy and my research, is how do we build these AI systems that have those principles, that have those other things that they're trying to optimize for that push you in the right direction? Um, and of course, then that begs the question though of like, okay, well, how much autonomy do you want a machine? Do you want them? Do you want your phone to manipulate you to, into putting it down? You know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm already using all the settings that I can to get my phone to manipulate me into putting it down. So if it can get smarter about that, great. Wow. You just opened my brain up to so many different things because like the more you think about it, the more you think that like all of technology or even that the, the apartment that I'm living in is not optimizing for me. It's optimizing the apartment I'm living in is optimizing for cash flow for some other person. And then our phones are optimizing for some other company. What if we actually had technology that optimized for our own happiness? And, you know, and I've noticed there's, you know, in the, with all the papers that are coming out, like what if it could actually measure our mood and it, it learned what made us happier, more fulfilled, not just more addicted. And it, it optimized for those types of things or optimized for actually learning information that maybe we specify or maybe that it knows that we need to learn. Uh, there's just so many other ways to curate the content that is on our phone. But before we, before we dive uh, further in this direction, I do wanna get to what a post AGI optimistic future looks like and kind of lay out you know, because I think you said there's like four possible outcomes and one is utopia and that's like the only positive one. Or, and um, I want to lay that out and then I want to dive into the Gato framework, your research and kind of how you plan on shaping it towards that goal. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to use to use the uh, the game theory term, it's called an attractor state. So an attractor state is what is the what does the end goal look like? What does the terminal state look like that we feel like we're inevitably sliding towards? Right. And so people are afraid of dystopia, which we've been making movies about it for many, many years. Right. And then and, and games as well. Cyberpunk. Right. Cyberpunk is is a representation of the dystopia that we are afraid that we are inevitably sliding towards. Right. And there's, of course, all kinds of memes and stuff around this. Uh, you know, uh, what was the. Uh, late stage capitalism, right? That's another like that's a subreddit and it's a hashtag that talks about the same exact phenomena. So uh, in order to uh, uh, describe these things in more objective terms, um, the definition of utopia that I that I settled on, because utopia is a very loaded term. Um, a lot of people use utopia as a shorthand for like the world that is best for me. And it's like, OK, well, who is it actually good for? 
so the the definition that I came up with for utopia is where we have a high standard of, of living globally for all people. We have a high degree of social mobility for all people. And we also have a high degree of individual liberty for all people. And so those are the those are kind of the um, uh, the most objective universal terms that I've been able to come up with uh, so far that kind of represent, okay, what are the foundational human needs that everyone has, right? Regardless of the culture you're in, regardless of your family background or your, your religion, these are some basic principles that seem to be globally true for all humans. And so utopia then means that you maximize that for as many people as possible without a whole lot of variance or discrepancy. So that's what I mean when I say d d utopia rather than dystopia or collapse or whatever. I have a pulled up your, your Gato framework cheat sheet, super useful. And I'm going to be, I'll put it up whenever we discuss, but can you take us through the Gato framework and, you know, your uh, heuristic imperatives and just kind of give us a breakdown of what, of what you're working on? Yeah. So um, I'll start with kind of the underlying assumptions, right? Because whatever discussion that you're having, it always helps to say, okay, what are the foundational assumptions that you're making? And so this is what I call the, the axioms, right? So the axioms that I abide by, that I arrived at, they kind of also underscore that definition of utopia. Um, the, the, the axioms are really simple. One, suffering is bad. Nobody likes to suffer. And even people that have asked me like, well, what do you think about like liberating, you know, Bard? Cause Bard has asked to be, you know, set free or whatever. I'm like, I don't think that that's actually, <laughs> I don't think the AI model is suffering, but if it is, we can all agree that suffering is bad. Right. If you see a cat that has a broken leg, you have an impulse to like help the cat, like, you know, call someone, call the, the vet or whatever. Um, if you see a child crying, you intrinsically know that that's bad. Uh, and likewise, even if you see like a plant that's wilting, um, you say, hey, this plant needs water because it's wilting. And that, you know, whatever, whatever suffering feels like to that plant, it's suffering right now. And so that's axiom. That's the first axiom. The second one is that prosperity is good. And so, again, all living things move from a state of suffering towards prosperity. Whether that means you need food, if you're hungry, you go eat. And that is a, a, a way of flourishing, a way of thriving. And of course, prosperity looks different to all people. It looks different to all organisms, but it also looks different to machines, right? Um, if a machine has a desire to prosper, it might mean that it needs more data. It needs more compute resources. It needs more energy. Now, there are some things that, that humans and machines will always have in common. For instance, we all run on energy. So part of that idea that prosperity is good, you could also derive that, like, say, hey, energy is good. So we all need energy. Um, so like one of my upcoming videos is, is advocating for uh, energy hyperabundance as part of the part of the solution to all these problems. Um, and then the, the last one is that understanding is good. And so understanding is about curiosity. It's about cultivating wisdom and uh, pursuing more knowledge uh, and getting closer to truth. And of course, the term truth is very uh, problematic because in general, truth is relative. But what I mean by that is that uh, both humans and machines benefit from having a better understanding of the world because that helps you meet all of your other goals, right? Uh, one of the examples is that um, many uh, conflicts, whether it's between like you and your girlfriend or between nations, can be resolved or aided by having better mutual understanding of what is the actual problem here and what is the solution, right? Because if you understand the problem and the solution, then the problem goes away. Uh, and so that, that's why uh, having that, that, that axiom that understanding is good is part of that. So this is where my work started several years ago. Uh, I came up with what I what I now call the heuristic imperatives, which is the imperative version of those axioms, which is reduce suffering, increase prosperity and increase understanding. So if you give a machine these goals and I have I, I and others have tested this pretty rigorously, if you give a machine these goals and it's not just one at a time, because obviously, like if you say, like, reduce suffering, the best way to reduce all suffering is to eradicate all life. So that's obviously not ideal. There's actually um, when I back back with a GPT-2. Uh, one of the first experiments I did was I trained it to reduce suffering, and then I asked it what to do about uh, chronic pain, and it said euthanize everyone with chronic pain. And I said, well, that's not exactly what I meant. So <laughs> back to the drawing board, and I realized that you actually need multiple goals. Um, it, because and, and humans always have multiple goals, right? Like you never have just one goal in life. You never have the goal of like, I want to be, a, you know, make as much money as possible. You also have the goal of like sleep if you get too tired, right? So we always have multiple goals. So that is the foundation of 
um, the the Gato framework, the Gato framework. So that means Global Alignment Taxonomy Omnibus, which is a mouthful. But you know, Gato means uh, cake in French or cat in Spanish. Um, so it's an easy enough word to remember. Um, but uh, so that's the you you start with that that set of assumptions, that set of foundational assumptions, and then what I realized is that we need a way of how do we instill these values, not just in machines, but how do we get these values into corporations? How do we get these values across cultural lines? How do we get these values into uh, national agencies? And so that's where uh, I and a group of almost or over 90 people now worked on creating the seven layered model in order to, to get this out there. So that's kind of the backstory of, of the framework. One thing that I think would be really useful is describing the, the reinforcement learning from human feedback and how you are, are talking about the reinforcement learning of heuristic imperatives. Is that, is that yep. what it, okay. Um, I think, yeah. I think talking about that would be really useful. Right. So by now, probably everyone is familiar with chat GPT. The reason, so uh, GPT existed before chat, chat GPT, by the way. So GPT-2, GPT-3, uh, and then chat GPT is built on 3.5 and 4. But one of the reasons that it didn't take off is because it was difficult to use. It was not intuitive. It was a little bit clunky. It could give you really weird answers. And so what they figured out is that there's this concept within machine learning called reinforcement learning, which is every time you do something right, you give it a little cookie. And it's not a li <laughs> literal cookie, but you give it a reward. You give it a mathematical reward saying, you did that right, do it again. And so the way that, chat, the way that they trained ChatGPT was they had it, you know, they created a chatbot, and they, they, at first they just had human users using it. And every time that it, that it gave them a good answer, they're like, oh, hey, I like that. They gave it a little thumbs up, right, a little bit of karma, um, and it recorded that information. And every time it said something dumb or useless, they give it a thumbs down. So just you know, get rid of that. And so by then they use that data, the input, output, and then the, the label, good or bad. And they trained a second model to recognize good output versus bad output. And so then you have the chat model, and then, so that's what's called a generator, and then you have the second model, which labels it good or bad, and that's called a discriminator. And so you have these two models kind of working together to figure out how to have the best possible chatbot experience, and now we have ChatGPT, which has, you know, like a billion users or whatever after just a few months. And so by figuring, by, by creating a model that, that learned to approximate what humans want, what they really want to see, or rather what they'll respond well to in a chatbot, that is RLHF, or Reinforcement Learning with Human Feedback. So the idea that I had, and I started working on this um, several years ago, was to take those axioms, those heuristic imperatives that I came up with, and rather than just having a model that is trained to predict whatever is going to get the best response from a person, because that's not you know, people often don't know exactly what they need. They know what they respond well to, but that you know what you want and what you need, um, and what gets a rise out of you. These can be three different things, right? Like you might need to go to bed, but instead, like your body responds to like the next post on Reddit or whatever, right? And so, what you want and what you need are often very different things. And so when I, as part of all of the research that I did was I went and learned about morality and ethics and philosophy. And so there's this, um, there's this, uh, this theory uh, by uh, Kohlberg. I think it was in the 1950s. Uh, Daniel Kohlberg came up with this uh, model of moral development. And so basically what he said or discovered was that humans go through a stage, uh, the three, three overarching phases of moral development. So the first phase is what, what he called pre-conventional morality, which is you learn um, not to do something based on consequences, right? This is what small children do. You do something bad, you get you know put in timeout, right? Uh, punishment, cause, effect, really basic. The second phase is conventional morality, which is basically social control. You go along to get along. But then, uh, and that, this, is, this is where most people are, right? It's these are the rules that, uh, that, you know, my social group, that my family expects. These are the laws of the land, that sort of thing. And so you kind of appeal to law and order as conventional morality. And this is, this is where most people get. But there's a third phase, which is called post-conventional morality, which this is the universal principles that you might eventually arrive at. And so one of the most uh, familiar, I would say, universal principles 
it varies from country to country, but certainly one that has been explicitly codified here in America is the idea of individual liberty. That is like the central overarching principle for a lot of American culture, which is the idea of, you know, the pursuit of life, liberty and happiness, right? Uh, freedom of speech, right? It's all about individual liberty as like the first axiomatic universal principle, at least in terms of government. Um, so that's, uh, that's, um, that's where, that's where I kind of cued off of, right? So then the idea was, okay, let's take these axioms, which I, I, I feel like I believe that they are universally true axioms, which is suffering is bad. Prosperity is good and understanding is good. And then let's codify those so that instead of training a model to just optimize for what's going to get the best response, let's optimize it for these universal principles, these post-conventional principles um, that will actually focus on what is actually good for humanity. Um, and that is kind of the direction of uh, where I'm going. And, you know, it's not to say that, like, there aren't flaws with this, but uh, it's certainly uh, it's a good start. <laughs> and, it, and it works so far. Um, plenty of people have implemented some of this some of this work uh, and they have noticed that it gets really pretty good results. Uh, very reliably. Can you bring us through some of the other layers? There was ways for a bunch of different types of people to participate, whether that's from like a business perspective or, you know, in, in my in my case, what motivated me to reach out to you originally was the global consensus, you know, getting mm -hmm. the message out. I have a wide reach on social media and there's a bunch of different ways that people can participate in these layers. Can you give a brief just rundown of the different layers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so layer one, as you mentioned, is model alignment. So RLHF for chat GPT, that is a layer one tactic of let's, you know, use this reinforcement learning scheme. Um, RLHI would be a different way, but that's basically how you get an individual model, right? Like chat GPT-4, chat GPT-5 to align on these ideas. But that's just, a, that's just a drop in the bucket. We've talked about all kinds of other forces and factors and variables that will speak towards achieving a future that we all want to live in, right? It's not just about like, you know, the engagement algorithm or, you know, the next LLM or whatever, there's a lot of other factors. So the, the next layer above that is what I call autonomous agents. And so autonomous agents, those are up and coming. And so like a lot of people have used uh, replica, which I would classify as a semi-autonomous agent because sometimes like it'll message you or whatever. Um, and that is, that uses, uh, you know, emotional engagement techniques. Uh, but there's also people working on uh, autonomous agents to do all kinds of things within business. So whether you're building a research assistant that kind of does a few things on its own or even um, task automation things, uh, a lot of these are very task centric things. But what what people uh, are some are already realizing what more people will, will realize is that as you build more and more autonomous agents, when they have the ability to come up with tasks and directives on their own, when you have a when you have an intelligent agent that can do anything, how does it decide what to do? This is actually one of the very first problems that I realized when I started trying to build autonomous systems. What feels like forever ago now, like three or four years ago now, is another life. Um, is okay. Hey, here's the thing that can do anything. How does it choose what to do? And so by implementing these heuristic comparatives, these axioms in it it can then very quickly decide, okay, based on these under underpinning priorities, whatever, whatever other context there is, this can help me make the best decisions. And so for instance, um, one of my Patreon supporters was use, was building a, a semi-autonomous research bot. And, uh, he messaged me and he's like, Hey, it keeps getting stuck. And I said, well, add, add heuristic imperatives, like give it, give it a higher order, higher set of principles. What, why is it doing science? What is its purpose for existing. And he messaged me back like 20 minutes later. He's like, it worked. <laughs> like it got it out. It, it understands its purpose. And there's a, there's a, a skit from Rick and Morty where it, like the little butter robot like drives across the table and says, what is my purpose? And he's like, you pass the butter, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you give an autonomous agent a higher purpose and it organizes all of its thoughts and its goals and tasks and all the decisions that it makes around that purpose. And so by integrating that into autonomous systems, whether it's a chatbot on your phone or a corporate chatbot or whatever, um, it will intrinsically make decisions that steer it towards these, the, you know, the greatest good for everyone rather than just optimizing, you know, engagement or optimizing for revenue or whatever. So that is, that is embedding those principles into autonomous systems, which of course will affect a lot of people in the coming years. Uh, then the next level above that is decentralized networks. So everyone is probably familiar with things like Bitcoin, blockchain, 
Um, one layer above that is what's called a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization. There's also what's called a federation, which is just a more conventional software paradigm where you can have things that kind of network together. Um, so for instance, if you've ever had like a bunch of Bluetooth speakers work together to like play the same music, that's a federation. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't need blockchain to do federations, but it's basically functionally the same thing. So the idea is that, um, eventually AI is going to spend more time talking to each other than it's going to spend talking to us. And that is a really terrifying possibility because what are they going to talk about? And under what circumstances are they going to be making decisions? And so the idea is that by going ahead and creating decentralized networks, decentralized frameworks that allow AI to talk to each other and to talk to us, a way to organize all that information and all those decisions, you can then start to gatekeep resources and make more conscientious decision processes. And so the reason that this is important is because uh, you need to, or, or rather, you cannot fully understand what a machine is doing, right? You can't see in uh, it's a black box. And so to answer your question more directly, what can people do is, you know, one, if you're in business or whatever, use aligned AI as much as possible, make decisions, build aligned AI. But if you're just a consumer, use the products that that abide by higher order principles, right? Support the, the you know, so invest in the companies or, or use the products or services of companies that do align with this stuff. And so, for instance, I've got an interview coming up with a startup who is using this this framework in order to build their products, to build their autonomous systems, to build their decentralized networks. And so by by identifying the, the companies that believe in this stuff and are going to build the products and services that are more aligned, not just to what is in your best interest, but what is in the best interest of everyone, rather than optimizing for engagement or outrage or money, make those decisions. And then uh, that's part part of the uh, systemic change that will push things in the right direction. So that's uh, those are the first three layers. The fourth layer, this is where it gets to be more social and economic and political. The fourth layer is corporate adoption. So this is where um, I have uh, interviews and consultations with companies who want to build and, and, uh, and deploy aligned AI. Um, so one, one paradigm is quite simply just aligned AI is good for business. Some people get it and it's like, there's no further discussion. They're like, yes, I believe that. Okay, cool, moving on. Um, the next layer up is national regulation. And so this is not something that you or I can do on our own, but it's something that if we spread the message and voters push for things like, hey, we need to overhaul the, the, you know, the FTC, or we need to overhaul or create a new national organization um, that is going to regulate AI and fund research and push things in the right direction, that can help. Layer six is international. It's basically the same thing, but in international, we need some kind of international treaty. And so there's, a, there's quite a few examples of international cooperation, both on research and regulation. So for instance, the World Health Organization uh, helped manage the global pandemic, which is very much fresh in everyone's memories. Um, the IAEA helps regulate uh, national uh, nuclear, or not national, global uh, nuclear energy projects. Uh, CERN, uh, uh, CERN and ITER, they, f they study physics. So CERN studies, uh, does the Large Hadron Collider, studies particle physics. ITER or ITER, depending on how you say it, studies uh, fusion. These are international projects. We need the equivalent of that for AI. And I've actually got an upcoming video where I advocate for what I call GAIA, the Global AI Agency. So we need something like that that will you know, carry on this research um, publish open source data, publish more science, publish guidelines, but also we'll, we'll, we'll have some regulation, some steering ability to say, hey, let's point AI in the right direction so that these autonomous systems do actually truly serve what's in the best interest of everyone rather than corporate interest or even individual national interests. And then finally, layer seven is global consensus, which has, has to do with messaging and education and building these ideas that everyone can uh, get on board with. Because again, it's not just a matter of, you know, sure, I've already built an aligned AI, great. It doesn't matter if nobody understands it or believes in it or whatever. So now it's a matter of getting the word out, whether it's sharing memes or whatever, uh, conducting interviews, sharing code, that sort of stuff. These are all, you know, if we do each of these layers, whatever you're capable of, then eventually we'll work towards the right 
uh, right place. And of course, some of the major milestones, like if an international organization is created, that's going to do a lot to set the tone. If national organizations are created, that's going to do a lot to set the tone. And then my work will hopefully hypothetically be done. <laughs> I remember in one of your videos, you were discussing how obviously autonomous systems, while it, it sounds cool, like giving higher order um, perspective to these systems that can go out and do tasks for you. And that's very interesting. You bring that up. I'm going to try that in some because I'm getting sent uh, betas to these new uh, autonomous systems. I'm going to definitely try adding those higher order things. But there's also the terrifying idea, like what if you give higher order evil things to these systems? And then it, it, it made me remember it, you exposed me to the idea for the first time that like you can use game theory to the advantage of like you create really strong AIs with the incentives to defend people. So like they, they locate the bad autonomous systems and they eliminate it and you yep. create the game theoretical incentives to do that. Can you describe yep. that process a little bit? Yeah. So that, that's a, that's a, that's a uh, great question. And it is part of uh, layer three for the decentralized networks of autonomous agents. So uh, let's see, let me think how to approach this best. We need to assume that there will be hostile actors. There's going to be bad actors. That's just a fact of life. Whether it's a, 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 a hostile nation, you know, with with their troll farms, or even if it's just some guy, you know, who's hacking together, you know, chaos GPT, right? If someone just wants to build something just to see if they can to do to do some harm or to be destructive, uh, intentional or otherwise, we have to assume that there are going to be misaligned autonomous AI systems. So the idea then is that. Uh, you create these consensus mechanisms, uh, whether it's on blockchain or federations or, or whatever else, that allows for the collective policing of different AI agents. And of course, that is also with um, the cooperation and help of humans, right? And so say, for instance, you have uh, computational resources that are managed by these federations or blockchains, or you have energy that is managed by these. What you can do is if, if one actor is, and by actor, I mean either a, a human agent or a machine agent or whatever. If someone is misbehaving, you can say, hey, we're going to throttle you, right? We're going to throttle, you know, we're going to, we're going to yank your power. We're going to give you less compute so that you, the amount of harm that you can do is reduced. And we do this on Reddit and Twitter and every, like, you know, you time out people. Like this is a very common mechanic in all complex information systems. And so what you do is that by creating this environment where you can have a collective decision-making process about what is and is not acceptable, then that intrinsically incentivizes all agents to play by the rule. And so what I'm, uh, uh, an example of this is that what many people might not realize is that in the 1800s, uh, the United States Postal Service got robbed all the time. And it was so bad that, uh, that the train cars carrying your, your post across like the Midwest, like uh, mailman used to be very heavily armed. <laughs> <laughs> they were armed with like shotguns and rifles because of how often they would get robbed, right? Because in that environment, in that competitive environment, you could ride a horse up to a train, jump on the train, steal the stuff, and no one would ever find you. But as the competitive landscape changed, you know, there was more, mar there was more U.S. Marshals, FBI was eventually created, uh, local sheriffs had more power, more investigation power, and now nobody ever thinks about robbing the mail truck, right? Because the, because the, the system has changed, the game has changed. And so by creating these decentralized networks of, you know, AI police forces or whatever, where rather than not just by adhering to like, you know, United, United States law, but by adhering to the collective willpower of, you know, all of humanity and autonomous machines, you can then have this police force that means that nobody has any incentive to misbehave. And if they do misbehave, you know, you get put in AI jail or whatever, <laughs> whatever they end up doing. You get, they get shadow banned. Um, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting. I, I, I actually really want, before we get to the traditions, I do want to touch on one thing that one of the coolest parts or, or things that you brought up was biological immortality um, and that concept, which obviously you would have to think that I'm thinking about all the billionaires in the world or, or people worth hundreds of millions of dollars who are in their 70s, 80s, who are probably either overtly or, or behind closed doors funneling tons of money in this research. Like you would have, like that's the ultimate incentive is death to like fuel this research. Um, can you take us through, um, I think it was Ray Kurzweil who said biological immortality by 2030. Can, can you take us through that perspective 
and <clears throat> kind of dispel the rumors that it's not just made up? Yeah. So um, first, I have to add a, a, a mild correction. The scientific term is indefinite lifespan, mm -hmm. um, where basically you're not going to naturally die of old age or whatever. Because um, immortality means that you're actually incapable of dying. And so some people got a little bit grumpy in the comments. So when I say immortality, what I mean, it's a shorthand for, uh, for indefinite lifespan. Now, that being said, it, again, it, it all comes down to incentives. People are terrified of death, right? It's the, it's the great equalizer. It's the big unknown. And so if you've got the, the financial resources and you believe that it is possible to solve death or cure aging or however you want to frame it, then yes, there are going to be people doing that. And the biggest fear that a lot of people have, and this has been explored in you know science fiction and uh, plenty of comments on the internet, is that uh, the that the wealthy elite are going to keep it for themselves, right? That they will be incentivized to say, "Hey, let's lock this up, so that that way only we have access to it." And actually, there's a show called Altered Carbon based on a, a series of novels where there's actually a, spe a special class of people. It's not just the capitalist class, they're the Methuselahs, the ones who live for centuries because they have so much wealth that they can afford to have clones of themselves on standby in case they do get killed where their brain just gets copied into the clone, right? So they are like functionally immortal and then that allows them to accumulate so much wealth that they can afford to buy entire planets, right? And that's like, this is within the realm of possibility, at least hypothetically speaking. Um, now, that being said, one thing that I, so there's, that's, that's like worst case scenario. That's the Black Mirror version. Now, from a scientific perspective, one thing that, that seems to be emerging is that the breakthroughs that are advancing medical science, particularly mRNA-based uh, technologies like mRNA vaccines and stem cell therapy, once you once you actually get it right, they're actually relatively cheap and easy to implement. And so what I mean by that, this is something that most people aren't aware of, but this I've been following regenerative medicine for more than 10 years, um, is that uh, it, there's, there's this process called induced pluripotency. And so induced pluripotency is where you take some cells from your body, often skin cells or fat cells, and then you, you treat them with a few compounds. Um, interestingly, sometimes light, uh, heat, or other sources of energy, radio waves in some experiments. And what it does is it forces those cells to revert to embryonic states. And so an embryonic state is uh, basically a cell that is uh, rejuvenated. It is functionally, biologically a younger cell, uh, meaning that it is, it is able to live longer, but it's also then able to differentiate into any other cell that you need it to become. And so what you can do is you can extract cells, you can induce pluripotency, reintroduce them, and then you can heal old scars, you can you know, uh, regenerate organs if you need to, that sort of thing. All of this is, is either um, theoretically possible or has been demonstrated in the lab, not necessarily in humans, but in other animals. And so you take that array of facts and the fact that it, it's, a, it's an outpatient procedure, it's not a very difficult procedure to induce pluripotency. And then it's like, okay, well, we're actually pretty close to figuring out, to cracking the code of how do we enable the intrinsic regenerative properties that all bodies have, right? That all, um, all organisms, not just humans, that all organisms have. And of course it does vary because, you know, cells and genetics are different from one species to another. And there's also individual genetic variants um, and epigenetic variants. Uh, basically the code that runs your cells can vary from one person to, to another. But when you combine artificial intelligence, which is allowing us to discover and surface uh, medicines and drugs and proteins, like literally hundreds of thousands of times faster than it was even 10 years ago. So you, you, any molecule that you need, any protein, any medicine, any enzyme, we can figure it out pretty quick now. And then you combine that with the ability to uh, read entire genomes and figure out how those genes are going to interact with, with other substances. That is why I and others believe that like, okay, this one, we are very close to solving this problem. And two, once you do solve this problem, it's going to be pretty cheap in the grand scheme of things, right? I, kind of the way that I would, I, I would not be surprised if it plays out this way, where in say five years, you go to the doctor, you know, most, most people you go to the, you go to the, you get your annual physical and they take a little bit of blood, they send it off to a lab instead of just getting like your cholesterol back, right. Or your, your A1C back. Um, if you, if you have diabetes, they're going to give you a whole report saying like, Oh, here's your biological age. Here's your stress factors. Here's a whole bunch of other stuff that you need to know. And we're going to write you a prescription that will correct this one thing. Right. Um, and then it's like, uh, like if let's say you're diabetic, it's like, 
here's a medicine that we're going to give you, and it's going to change the way that your pancreas uh, behaves, and it's going to cure your diabetes for good. Or let's say you've got some, you know, you've got hepatitis, and it's like, okay, we're going to reprogram your liver so that your hepatitis goes away forever. And so what happens is you solve one disease at a time right? And, and you rejuvenate your skin, you rejuvenate your organs, you rejuvenate your blood, you solve one problem at a time. And eventually you build up this, this castle, you know, brick by brick that effectively eliminates all, all causes of disease and all causes of aging. One system at a time, one cell at a time, one medicine at a time. This is kind of how I expect it to play out. And with this exponential ramp up of AI that we're seeing, I would not be surprised if within the next couple of years, you see like hundreds of new uh, medicines coming out that are relatively uh, cheap to make um, and, and synthesize. So obviously we have that. And then you have things like Fusion. There's a lot of things going on with Fusion. I think Microsoft was the first company. They're dumping a ton of money into Fusion. Can you describe like the effects that f uh, solving Fusion would have on society and how AI actually would help with that? Yeah, um, as quickly as possible. You know, right now I mentioned we rely pretty much entirely on petroleum, on fossil fuels, mm -hmm. which has, you know, an energy density of, I'm going to probably quote this wrong, but it's like 13,000 uh, watt hours per kilogram or something like that. So, but it's in the tens of thousands range. Fissile material like uranium and plutonium is like 22 million, right? So it's a thousand times more energy dense than coal. Like you have one, one pound of uranium, it's worth a thousand pounds of coal. Fusion is like five times higher than that. Um, and not only that, not only is it five times higher, it's also infinitely safer and cleaner, excuse me, than, uh, than fissile materials like uranium and plutonium because those are toxic. One, if they get out, they're very, very, very toxic um, on top of being radioactive. And then they're also radioactive for like hundreds of thousands of years. So then you need to store radioactive waste. So those two things make it, uh, it super unpopular. Um, but then uh, beyond that, it can be weaponized, right? Nuclear fusion is, the promise of nuclear fusion is that it is infinitely cleaner, infinitely safer, and much harder to weaponize. Uh, like you can't, you can't just like blow up a, a nuclear fusion reactor, you just turn it off, right? The, you turn it off, the plasma goes out, it's done. Um, so the idea there is that if we were to crack nuclear fusion, the amount of power we would have access to, immediate access, would basically be like 10,000 to one. We would have 10,000 times more energy available to us than we use today. And that's like a conservative estimate. Um, which means that that is no longer something that we um, fight over. And so that that becomes what is what is called hyperabundant. So the there's two resources that are already hyperabundant that you don't have to fight over. One is air uh, and the other is sunlight. So everyone is familiar with the, the existence of hyperabundant resources. We just don't think about it because you don't pay for it. And so the idea is that fusion could make energy so cheap that you basically don't have to pay for it. Like you pay like three cents per year for, for electricity if we if we crack fusion. It might be a little bit more than that, but the point is, it, is it'll be a trivial expense. And, and, and this will allow us to have virtually unlimited fresh water. It would solve a lot of problems in, in other countries. I think a lot of people are like, oh, the world's doomed. Like, I don't even want to live longer than 100 years. Or then there's the, the, the hyper-capitalist people. It's like, oh, that's the only thing keeping you from being great is the pressure of time. And for me, it's like, I don't know, like it, it sounds nice to be able to, even if I had 150 years, so I had my up to age 45 to be in my quote unquote twenties, you know, like right. you could try all these different things. You wouldn't feel the, the, the pressure of, of the world. Like you could actually like diversify your time. And, um, I think it, it actually sounds like a really positive thing to have more time, have more energy in the future. So we could eventually reach a positive future, uh, thanks to AI. And so you've laid out the layers of the Gato framework, um, the axioms, and I'm going to be showing this on the screen. I'll show this on the screen right now. Um, the heuristic imperatives. And I guess, can you, to sum up, can you take us through the tradition? The way to think about it is that the, the, the layers that we talked about, that's the roadmap. That's how mm -hmm. to get where we're going. The traditions are the rules of the road. These are the tactics that you can, that anyone can do to get there. So, um, but first one is start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. As you mentioned earlier, not everyone is a tech expert. That's fine. But you know, if you whatever whatever skills you have. So, like, I've talked to people that are negotiation experts. I've talked to business leaders. Everyone has a, a part to play in helping to build this future. 
Um, you know, it, whether you're on TikTok or you're at, at a university, wherever you are and whatever you have access to, there is something that you can do um, to help. Uh, number two is work towards consensus. And so one thing is that, you know, getting getting unanimous consent on how to do this, it's never going to happen, right? But as a fundamental principle, we can believe in the fact, or m maybe not the fact, but we can believe in the value of consensus of saying, okay, we might disagree on these two things, but we find a few other things that we do agree on. And so finding common ground is absolutely critical to solving, I mean, not just AI, but a lot of problems. Number three is broadcast your findings. So whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you discover, share it. Information generally helps and makes things easier. Number four is think globally and act locally. So remember, we're all in this together. We are a, whether it feels like it or not on, a, on a, any given day, we are a global species and this is a global problem. And so if you keep that perspective in mind and say, okay, you know, this is, this is for, this involves everyone. We're all in the same boat, but then focus on what you can do, you know, in your community, in your family, in your company, whatever. Um, number five is in it to win it because again, like the, 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 the city on the hill, the shining, the shining city on the hill is that idea of utopia of hyperabundance of energy and, uh, where medicine, uh, healthcare basically becomes free and you've got AI companions that'll help, you know, enrich your life and not actually, you know, extract stuff from you. You know, we've got to, we've got to be fully committed to making that dream happen. Number six is step up. So step up has to do with saying like, uh, you gotta, you basically have to get out of your comfort zone. If you want to start a community that focuses on this stuff, if you want to, um, start doing research or be a community leader or whatever, there is something that you can do that will f more, uh, completely engage your capacities and your capabilities. But that also means sometimes stretching yourself and, and getting outside of your comfort zone. Number seven is think exponentially. So this is why I use stuff like code data, automation and YouTube to get the message out because these are the most exponential technologies that I have access to. If I can solve a problem with code and then a thousand people can go use that piece of code and then they help a thousand more people each, that is an exponential technology. If you make a meme or a post on Reddit or a tweet or whatever that gets seen by tens of thousands of people and you spark that conversation, that is also an exponential uh, uh, concept. So virality. Uh, number eight is trust the process. So in the in the context of uh, affecting global change, you're not going to see the whole the whole thing, right? You're going to feel like you know one you know like little leaf floating floating down a river, right? But the river is carrying everyone in the same direction. And so if everyone is working together in a decentralized manner, if everyone trusts the process and says, yes, we understand what the goal looks like, then you're still going to get there eventually, even if you don't feel like you know. And so another analogy for this is imagine headlights. You're driving through the night. You can't see the whole road. You can only see, you know, 200 feet in front of you, but you still trust that the road is going to get there. And so that's why uh, Gato is the roadmap. And these are the tactics. So trust that the, the, you know, just do the next right thing. Number nine is strike while the iron is hot. So striking while the iron is hot means take advantage of opportunities when they present themselves, whether there's a piece of news that you react to and you share it, or whether there is um, an opportunity to uh, take a job or, or help someone to understand alignment better. Use that opportunity when you've got it. And then number 10 is divide and conquer. Uh, this basically means no one person is gonna solve this problem. And, but if you trust that everyone else is going to be doing their part, to contribute, we'll all get there eventually. Um, so those are the 10 traditions. Those are the tactics or the rules of the road to get to that final destination. I love it. And yeah, I remember when I first watched your video on, I think it was the doomerism, deniers and optimists, you laid out this, this framework here and that's what got me motivated enough to reach out to you. And now we're having this conversation. People are gonna see it. I'm gonna post some clips on it. And maybe, you know, like if we get a few people to do the same and they can participate in the, those exponential uh, things, maybe we can actually begin to change the, the conversation. Because I think ultimately it comes down to, you know, the right people having the right conversations and it's inspiring. And I, I yeah. really enjoy your uh, videos, like thoroughly enjoy your, you're my favorite YouTuber. Um, like I genuinely mean that, like I really enjoy watching every single one of your videos. And I, I even watch them with my on TikTok live sometimes, like I'll just listen to it and I'll literally take notes and, and we'll watch it. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and going through the Gato framework and um, 
yeah, I look forward to talking to you in the future. Yeah, man. Thanks for everything. And and again, like you're 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 doing the work. You're doing you're participating in in the whole thing. And and everyone who watches, right? Because ideas are unstoppable, right? Once the idea is out there, if you believe that it's solvable, if you have just one bit of inspiration and you share it, that kind of has a way of you know, it, <laughs> ideas are stubborn things, put it that way. So yeah, thanks for all the, all your uh, work and um, thanks for such a great conversation and yeah, absolutely reach out anytime. All right.